Hello there, I'm your host Dan Rojas. Over the years, we've done some pretty cool things with regular beverage containers, drinking bottles, glass, and plastic. We've put glass beer bottles and other wine bottles in front of the intense focal point of a large Fresnel lens, causing the glass to stress and shatter and made some really cool slow motion video of that. We've also taken plastic drinking bottles. We were one of the first to show you how to start a fire with it using the bottle as an optical device to create a small focal point that will actually burn stuff. We made one of the simplest Huron's fountains you'll ever see using three regular plastic bottles. We've shown you how to use a cutting device, put a score line on the bottle, and use hot water, one of the first to show you how to do that, to create a stress line that separates the glass very easily to make nice drinking glasses or different things with it. And we have taken the broken glass from the beer bottles, wine bottles, whatever it is we were melting, and we have made some really cool works of art that's melted into these really cool pieces and taken long strands of glass and stretched it out over a long distance. We've also showed you how to drill holes in glass bottles to make a very cool DIY level out of water using two bottles and a long piece of polyethylene tubing that allows you to tell if two areas, like the tops of posts, are level from say 100 feet away. The links to all of those videos are in the more info area below where you can find them on our channel Green Power Science. This video we're going to be using that hole drilling method. We're going to be drilling a 1 quarter inch hole in the upper part of a glass bottle, placing a piece of 1 quarter inch polyethylene tubing in there all the way down to the bottom. When this bottle is filled all the way to the top of the liquid, it begins to flow out of the tube. At this point, it's just a hole in the bottle. But once the liquid reaches a level below the highest part of that polyethylene tubing, it becomes a siphon. And it will actually pull all of the liquid out of that bottle, or well, most of it, until the very little at the bottom. So this is how you create a siphon without having to suck on anything or do anything special to get the siphon started. Gravity does it for you. So why do a project like this in the first place? Well, if you are a science teacher and you want to teach students how a siphon works, this is a good way to do it. Also, you can place this bottle inside of a vacuum chamber. Draw a vacuum, the siphon will get itself going, and it will still siphon even when there's a vacuum present, which proves that a siphon is actually caused by gravity. There's been some debate over the years whether it was air pressure or whether it was gravity that caused the siphon. If you can draw a vacuum and a siphon still occurs, that kind of settles it. Somebody did a very elaborate experiment. This is the easiest way to show it. Now, it will work right up to the point to where the liquid inside starts to boil from the intense vacuum. The reason that it stops is that the little bubbles that are created disrupts the flow of water and it stops the siphoning process. Once those bubbles go back, even though the air pressure is very low in there, it still flows at the same rate. So, I'm on the side of gravity. While boiling water inside of a vacuum chamber is 8th grade science, using this siphon method does add an additional twist if you are a science teacher to show students how to do this. For those of you that missed 8th grade science or whatever grade that they showed it to you, the water or the liquid does not get hot. What happens is the air pressure drops so much that it boils. The higher up you go, the lower the air pressure, the lower the boiling point. At sea level, water boils at roughly 212 degrees Fahrenheit, actually more or less exactly that. As you go up higher, it's lower, some very high elevations. Water will boil at 190, 195 degrees Fahrenheit. If you do not have a vacuum chamber and you want to show students how water boils, you can use a regular monojet syringe designed to irrigate your mouth if you get wisdom teeth pulled or whatever. You just put the liquid inside of there, pull one end of it, and when you do, you displace the air and it creates a very strong low pressure system which causes water to boil. Liquids like isopropyl rubbing alcohol that have a lower boiling point will actually be more dramatic. Very simple way to show students how liquids can boil inside of a vacuum. This is the simplest way to make a self-siphoning device. I'm your host Dan Rojas, thank you for watching and enjoy our videos. This is a little green power science extra. We have vacuum chambers of all shapes and sizes around here that we use for different purposes, from very small pressure cookers to larger ones, all the way up to this mega 
vacuum chamber that can hold like 150 pounds per square inch of pressure. We use them for resins to degas them or for different things. You can buy a lid for a five gallon plastic bucket for simple resin degassing. It works okay. I've seen some people do some DIY videos on them, but these are the best bet for it. Now I have actually made some very large box vacuum pressure chambers out of wood. The cool thing about these chambers is that they're a flat box design. That's pretty rare because usually things are cylindrical because that's how pressure prevents things from exploding. Usually a flat area will push up or push down. Because I use extremely thick wood, each one of these tables weighs anywhere from 300 to 450 pounds. So I made this pressure chamber five years ago. You can see that the top of it is three and a half inches thick of solid wood. These are two by fours that have been put all the way down, straightest two by fours I could find. And in between here, they're sealed with um, glue. And it's so heavy, the top of this is like 150 pounds. The bottom's the same, very thick. So when you're dealing with the flat area, you don't want it to bow up or do anything. So it has a winch. What I usually do in case it fails up there is I put a block in there to protect it so when I'm working in here but if you look I don't know if you can see that or not but this is all sealed with rubber so what we did was we laid it on one side all the sides they've got it all the way around the base is sealed it's 100% sealed inside there's a tube that comes in here that allows us to either put pressure or draw a vacuum. When we draw a vacuum, this gasket, which is just that rubber uh, hose that you use for slingshots and shit, goes in there on top of silicone. So when you draw a vacuum, it sucks down and it does its job. To use it for pressure, I've got 50 clamps that go on there because you have to clamp every three inches, otherwise even though this wood's extremely thick, it doesn't, it'll actually even start to bend this. Just 35 pounds of pressure of air with the small volume can actually bend wood like this. So if you look, that's all sealed and the walls are sealed all the way around, completely airtight. So the air volume that we're dealing with is this small gap right here, which would be enough to really cause some problems with a lot of pressure. So whenever I pressurize it, and I'm working on a Fresnel lens, this isn't actually a Fresnel lens that I'm working on, this is just a shitty one that we had, but um, I've got spacers that come in here, they're solid blocks that fill this space. This serves two purposes. We can actually channel in, I've got a small, um, fiber optic thing that comes in and puts UV light in or you can use small UV lights like this I've got a reflective uh, sheet that sticks to the top of this so if you put about 30 of these little UV flashlights in there well not 30 but 5, 10, 15 the UV cure resins will actually cure within oh, probably 2 or 3 hours not a big deal you can speed it up but the slower process works better and over here, this one is currently being used for storage. This is the monster one, and the top on it, the base of it is this thickness all the way down, so it's eight inches thick, and this one's showing its age because we have a high humidity area, but it's got, this is attached to it. This is a standard vacuum seal setup. So for the vacuum, we do that. I don't really do a lot of pressure with this because the volume inside, but this one, the, the top of it's really heavy. I haven't put a winch up to that I-beam yet, but um, I just have like four or five people help me lift it. The inside of this is also completely sealed with rubber. And it is solid wood. Because our purpose is flat objects like Fresnel lenses, we do not need a big round space to do that. If I did, I would have a chamber the size of this room and should something happen, like the chamber rupture at say 100 PSI, well, I'd probably blow this building up in half of my neighborhood. Because the chamber that we're using, the lens is very thin, very small amount of air, you don't need to worry about that. If something were to fail, it would just be a little pop because you don't have that massive amount of air. 
It only takes a few minutes to draw a vacuum. It takes a minute to get pressure built up. A large chamber could take very long time, very powerful pumps. So it's really cool. But these chambers are very thick wood, three, four inches thick. They're lined with a nice rubber interior. I use these pretty much every day. This is our collection of vacuum chambers. I'm your host, Dan Rojas. Thank you for watching and enjoy our videos. By the way, that self-siphoning bottle works great for fish tanks. You can just put a little cap on it and have another hose come out. You don't have to suck on anything or get any fish water in your mouth.